Well, good morning, and look who's back. It's me, Kenny Bonkari, your host of the party. And today is April 10th, 2024. And here are the things you need to know, because there's a lot going on. Now, you know, we've been talking about this for, uh, you know, weeks now and actually months. But the CPI is coming. And in fact, it came out, and it was hotter than expected. The FOMC minutes are out too, right? They're going to come out at about 2 o'clock. What are we going to learn? Anything new? Probably not. Some are asking, is Intel suddenly challenging NVIDIA for the top AI spot? I'd say not so fast. Industrial metals quietly surging. Well, maybe not so quiet. And Mohamed Alarian, right, is now suggesting that the Fed's target should be 3%, not 2%. Right? Oh boy, that's a whole other conversation. And what do we have for dinner tonight? We're gonna to have the one pan sweet sausage orzo pasta, which is really simple to make, it'll become a family favorite. Uh, everyone enjoys this. Okay, so you gotta ask, was it a head fake? Stocks came under pressure for most of the day, ended up advancing in the final minutes of trading as traders positioned themselves for today's key inflation data point. A data point that many think are gonna define the Fed's next move. Uh, because we, because it, it has the potential to cause all kinds of havoc and chaos. Now, while there's a wide range of opinions about what the data is gonna suggest, there is evidence that inflation remains sticky, stubborn in fact. And if that's the case again uh, today, which is expected, then it should reinforce the idea that the Fed is gonna sit tight and continue to do nothing, no multiple rate cuts, right? Remember the CPI year over year is expected to rise Expected to be up 3.4%, up from 3.2% last month. And recall both the January and the February reports for both the CPI and PPI were hotter than expected. And you, so you can hear the clock tick. In fact, CPI just came out and it was hotter than expected. So in fact, it is doing, it's, that trend up now uh, is starting to take on a life of its own as, we, as we've been talking about. One month, maybe not. Two months, maybe not. Three months now is an upward trend. As noted, stocks began the day yesterday, but felt like a dead cat bounce. But by 10.30, all the indexes were negative, right? Not dramatically, but they were still negative. Only adding to the weak performances that we've seen over the past couple of weeks before making an attempt to push higher back into positive territory by the end of the day. At 4 p.m., the Dow was down 9, but the S&P was up 8, the Nasdaq gained 53, the Russell added 7, the Trench was up 35, while the equal-weighted S&P uh, gained 27 points. Tesla, one of this year's biggest losers, led the gains in mega cap tech yesterday, rising by 2.3%, even as Elon braces for the potential to see back-to-back -back sales declines when they announced. This after analysts at both Jeffries and Sandler predicted a weak 2024 for Tesla. NVIDIA, on the other hand, right, it was 2023 and 2024's tech uh, uh, AI star came under pressure, falling 2%, leaving it down 14% off its most recent high. After Intel, which was up 1%, introduced their newest AI chip that some think is going to give Jensen Huang, right, NVIDIA CEO, a run for his money. I'd say, let's not get crazy. Now, from a chart perspective, NVIDIA is just 45 points away from the short-term trend line at 808, a level that should offer some support. But if it fails to hold, then 760-ish, which would represent a 20% decline, would be next in line. A 20% decline would still leave the stock up 52% on the year. Just FYI, and for those people who, who top ticked it and bought the stock at 966, you might want to consider averaging down a little bit as you build your position in this name that's not going away. Now, from a sector perspective, real estate was way out in the lead yesterday, right? The XLRE was up 1.3%, a dramatic move for a not-so-sexy sector, and the sixth straight day of investor interest, right, taking that, uh, uh, that sector uh, from a year-to-date loss of nearly 6% to now a year-to-date loss of 2%. Names in the sector include PLD, AMT, CCI, uh, SPG, PSA, and DLR. The moves lower this year in these names can be credited to the idea that the Fed may have had to raise rates before cutting them. Right Now, that was no longer the story, but let's see what happens after today. And while the Fed may not cut rates anytime soon, the idea that rates are not going higher was presenting an opportunity for some bargain hunting. But that could again flip on its head after today's report. Behind real estate, we had utilities, tech, consumer discretionary, consumer staples, all up by about a half a percent. Healthcare and basic materials up by three tenths. We had communications up by one tenth. Energy was flat. Uh, while industrials and financials ended the day lower, down two tenths and down six tenths of a, a percent, respectively, as you know, we continue to see money kind of shifting around and get reallocated based on uh, the latest narrative. 
bonds which have been under pressure this year gained in price right the tlt was up nine tenths the tlh was up eight tenths of a percent the two year is now yielding 4.73 percent the 10 years yielding 4.35 the shorter term treasuries continue to offer yields greater than five percent the three month is yielding five and a quarter percent while the six month is yielding 5.1 percent on an annualized basis 12 month cds are continuing to pay you about five and a quarter percent if you lock up your money for 12 months if the cpi comes in cooler than expected which it did not then you could watch for that pop in the bond market, a pop which I think would be temporary because in the end, I don't really think interest rates are going significantly lower. In fact, I'm in the Jamie Dimon camp thinking that we could see rates go up as Janet brings more treasury supply to the public market. And again, as inflation remains sticky, it's going to cause the Fed to rethink strategy. Again, this is just from the treasury side. It's a simple supply and demand story, right? More supply equals lower bond prices. Lower bond prices equal higher yields. Now, a sector that we don't talk about a lot is industrial metals, right? So you think zinc, copper, nickel, silver, platinum, aluminum, and gold. Yeah, I know we talk about gold, but from the industrial metal complex. These metals are all used for industrial purposes. Think steel making, construction, chemical manufacturing, EVs, etc. And they're highly durable and are excellent at providing electrical and thermal conductivity, which is why they are industrial metals. Now, the Bloomberg Industrial Metals Index, the B-C-O-M-I-N, is up 9% in the last two and a half weeks. And that speaks to the strength of a rebounding global economy and the need for these industrial metals. A closer look finds copper up 9%, zinc up 12%, silver up 15%, gold's up 9%, platinum's up 10%, and nickel's up 10%. All of these price increases are not going to help the PPI index which is out tomorrow, right? That's the prices paid by manufacturers for raw materials that eventually make their way down into the CPI. A look at the metals and miners ETF, the XME, finds that it was up 1% yesterday, leaving it up 5% year to date. Names in this sector include FCX, which by the way, got an upgrade yesterday by Bank of America analyst, Law Winder, right? It gained 2% and he's got a $59 price target on it. You also go to Alcoa, Newmont Mines, um, UEC, NUE, uh, and steel dynamics. Oil remains elevated. This morning, WTI is up 20 cents at 85.40. We know the story. An improving global economy, growing demand, OPEC plus production cuts, and lots of geopolitical unrest. Of these, it is the growing demand story that I think is going to continue to drive this latest move higher and then oil higher in general. Global electricity demand is expected to grow faster over the next three years and beyond. Demand from the new tech, think AI chips, uh, and a growing population, improved manufacturing, and higher living standards, all key contributors to driving prices higher. And while the world embraces clean energy, demand for fossil fuels is not going away anytime soon. Now, gold is trading at 2365 this morning, right? Uh, global unrest, central bank buying, and a hedge against inflation, and demands from the industrial metal usage are all part of this very exciting story. Now, while I think it goes higher still, I would not be surprised to see it retreat and churn a bit lower until uh, it gets to be about 2300 so maybe down 60 bucks or so. It'll find some, some support there and then churn higher. EcoDebt today includes that all-important CPI, which you already got. Real average hourly earning, earnings and weekly earnings year over year, and then the March FOMC minutes. Uh, and so you got to ask, are they going to reveal anything new? I say not so much. JJ's made it quite clear what the narrative is and what is, it and what is important, right? The others that come out and make comments do that at the behest of the Fed chair so that he can take the temperature. Some of them continue to suggest multiple rate cuts, which is ridiculous. Others suggest a more muted response, right? Think Rafi Bostic yesterday said he thinks one cut, while the latest suggests that we should expect no cuts at all. Think Roger Ferguson, who's a former member, and Neil Kashkari, Minneapolis president. I'm in the no cut camp, but I would not be surprised to see a rate cut right before the election in a vain attempt to give JoJo one last boost before the election. I will note that any move by the Fed within that six month window of a presidential election has always been discouraged, so not to look partisan. But that was then. This is now. It's a different world. And not to be outdone, yesterday, Mohammed Alarian, right? He had this to say. And I quote, inflation will be sticky, but that shouldn't stop the Fed because the 2% target is too tight. 
for the global economy going through a major rewiring. And boom, there it is. The Fed reached out to Mohammed to float the idea that the 2% target is unrealistic. So prepare yourself for a 3% target. And if that's the case, then yes, the Fed can say, look, we won, and suggest that rates could go lower. I think it's a mistake, but you see how they did that? Anyway, at six o'clock this morning, futures were suggesting a small rally, right? Um, I haven't, I, you know, they were up small. I have not seen what they've done now since the CPI report came out. So let's, let's uh, get over that and talk about uh, what it might suggest, right? Um, look, the CPI report, uh, some are going to think it's not much of a factor. They think the market's already re, uh, reacted to it and is accepting the idea that the Fed does nothing, right? It wasn't reacting, though, to a stronger CPI. So don't be surprised if we see some bargain hunting uh, after the pullback in stocks driven by concern about inflation and what the CPI will say. Look, the S&P is only down 1% off the high, which is really nothing. But like we've discussed, some bigger kind of core portfolio S&P names have gotten repriced. NVIDIA, Apple, Johnson Johnson, Coke, Procter & Gamble, Lilly, Walmart, Costco, and a host of others have all declined by much more than 1%. Some, some are down 10 to 20%. And so these names offer longer term opportunities to investors looking to add to core positions. Many continue to suggest that the market is too expensive. To which I would say, is it the market or is it the tech sector? Look around. Financials, energy, healthcare, industrials, basic materials, aerospace and defense, metals and miners, utilities, all appear to be fairly valued or even cheap. Remember, I keep telling you, um, uh, don't chase tech up here. Now, there are other places to put some money. But in the end, it depends on who you are and where you are on the risk scale and the life cycle scale. If you're 30 to 50, you should be buying tech carefully, but you should be, right? If you're 60 plus, then you want to own some if you don't already own it. But at least you need to be a bit more cautious on how you're buying it, Garish. Okay, European stocks this morning were all higher. They were up about half a percent across the board when I wrote this blog. Investors are awaiting today's CPI report and also awaiting tomorrow's ECB rate decision. The S&P closed at 52.09. It was up eight points. We're in the 51.70, 52.70 trading range. A CPI that does not raise the temperature will see the algos go into buy mode. While one that leaves it questionable could see us churn lower. And after today's uh, CPI is tomorrow's PPI. So the fun isn't over yet. And after today's hotter CPI, you can kind of expect that tomorrow we're going to get a hotter PPI. In the end, stick to your plan. Talk to your advisor. This is not time to bail, but nor is it time to chase stocks. That doesn't mean you can't put money to work uh, in other sectors that are expected to outperform. In the end, you know who you are right? You want your risk profile is and you want to make sure that your goals are aligned. Talk to your advisor, call me to discuss. I'm always happy to have that conversation. Okay. So now it's time to uh, talk about dinner, right? So we're having dinner tonight. So this is a simple, it's a one pan dish, right? You make everything in this one pan. You can serve it right out of the pan. Don't make a mess. Simple to do. It's sweet sausage orzo. So for this, you need the sweet Italian sausage. You need garlic clove. You need shallots, chicken broth, sun-dried tomatoes, shredded zucchini. You need spinach, light cream, salt and pepper, olive oil, Italian herb seasonings, some fresh basil, and of course, fresh grated parmigiana and cheese, and then the orzo pasta. You want to start by adding some olive oil to a large saute pan that's going to accommodate everything. Add in the chopped garlic and the sliced shallots, saute it around for three or four minutes. Now add in the sweet sausage, right, that you've taken out of the casing. Add in the sausage, brown it all up, season it with salt and pepper and some of the Italian herbs. Next, after that's all nice and brown, you're going to add the chicken broth, enough to cover the sausage. Bring it to a boil, add the orzo, and then add the shredded zucchini. Stir it so you're mixing it all well. Now add in the fresh spinach, the sliced sun-dried tomatoes. You can add some of the oil if you want. If you don't want to, don't add it. Uh, and you're going to add the cream. You're going to simmer until it's all cooked. You're going to then take it, top it with the fresh grated parmigiana cheese and some fresh basil, and then serve it. Now look, if it sucks up all the broth and it looks like it's getting dry, that's fine. Just add some more broth to keep it moist. You don't want this to be dry, but you don't want it to be soupy either. You just want it to be moist. So adjust as necessary. Uh, in any event, it's going to be a beautiful day here in South Florida. I guess uh, today's Wednesday. We're, we're expected to go up to 90 degrees today, which is a little unseasonable for this time of the year. But look, it beats uh, 30 degrees, right? In any event, until tomorrow, take good care.